Welcome to Baxa Rubliana, second part of my tour through southern Germany. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> uh, I have to apologize, I was still a little bit sick the last days after my tour through Albania and uh, Montenegro and then I had the extra second tour through Montenegro and uh, Kosovo and then I had uh, this press conference in Graz and then I was a bit sick now then. Then I had a Vienna week but I was planning a lot of activities but I could at least you know attend the Austrian National Day and that was good. I could also have this, um, that was my first ever to be in a big talk show, directly invited. And it was a big Austrian talk show in the Mateschitz uh, Hangar 7. I was actually very happy with that reality. And I hope there will be more invitations to come. I will now go to Tirol uh, to make another media appearance. And I also found out the way for Carinthia. So a southern swing further to the west is absolutely possible. But I have to manage the time as well. There are some big events in Vienna, which I always want to attend as well. And so I have to see how much time I can afford and how much activity is possible to get this done. Yeah, let's see. Austria has nine federal states. It's my ambition to make one event in each of the nine federal states. And I think I can do that. Because ultimately all Austrians must be safe. And I think there is more pro-NATO support in the Western states. That's also my logic because it's very important, the Western states. And historically they have more links with... I mean, for Alberg has more links with Switzerland. That's also a sadly neutral country which is shamefully blocking now ammunition for Germany. But, yeah, let's not be too negative. This actually is very good news here. This is an important uh, east-west highway, which was traditionally neglected by Germany. But now they are building it also in three lanes. I'm here on the Stuttgart-Nürnberg highway, which is an important east-west uh, traversale for Europe. Uh, crossing here the mountains. I will have to sneeze. <coughs> I'm sorry. No. Sneezing, drinking coffee, podcasting. It's all very messy here in this car. But I'm here with all my stuff. Moving back home. In many ways. Home. <coughs> sorry. Home is a big question. Because how much at home? I'm in Red Vienna, that's a big question, but I studied there and it was a very nice time. I envy, I have great fond memories of my study times. And I started my political activities in Vienna, obviously. And yes, and Vienna certainly is the place I feel most at home, yes. But politically, it's of course a very difficult place, yeah. Very left wingish and very red. Protectionist, xenophobe, unfriendly. And the enlargement. It's a mess. But, okay, it's changing. There are more and more people coming from the new countries. And the more Albanians and Montenegrins and Macedonians die in Vienna, the better. And all those complainers will be soon in the minority. But of course, <clears throat> there's a lot of Serbs as well, neutralists. That's very mean. Yeah, here we are on the road to Nuremberg. And then I will head further towards the east to that beautiful city of Vienna. Yes. And then I have to go back to Regensburg to bring back um, this car because till today, in the year 2022, you cannot rent a car in uh, 
Germany and give back in Austria without a big fee. And why? It's not because of the car rental companies being very complicated, because our shameful European elites yeah, have uh, not allowed uh, that you can rent out a car with a different number plate in another country. So that means, yeah, for example, Abyss is a global company. I'm renting here with Abyss. You cannot um, lease a car with a German license plate in Austria, it seems. And so they have to drive them all back. And because otherwise there would be maybe competition. Maybe the car rental companies would register in one country and because they are cheaper um, prices and then they would um, use them in other cars. For example, in Estonia could be then a car rental paradise. But no, the European Union has stopped that because the left-wing economics is uh, against the consumers, is against uh, real uh, efficiency in the market and they all claim some reason behind it, yeah. And it's ultimately only their tax protectionism and their left wing. Keep everything as at home. Oh, we must do everything local. Uh, how terrible the left is. How destructive the force of the left is still today. That is really very mean. Yeah, 80 kilometers to go. Uh, we will. Europe will be stronger than the left wing protectionists. But of course, you know, they are giving a big battle. And they are of course trying to stop Mercosur. And they are trying to stop everything. And then when everything stops, <coughs> they are happy. Yesterday I had the very unpleasant pleasure again to watch German television. You know, the political television. When you see a report about uh, Germany and how it is. So they start, we have too many migrants. Uh, migrants are no longer people, but they are migrants like ants. Yeah? So that's uh, the Nazi past of Germany. And it comes out every day. Uh, so they have 1.2 million, yeah? that's a lot. But we have also war and most of them are anyhow from Ukraine. And we should be in solidarity. If the Germans had better policy, maybe we didn't have uh, this war. The Germans wanted cheap gas. And now they can take uh, consequences of cheap gas and that's the war Russia wages and then the people run away because it's cold and there will be much more coming. But Germany is complaining. Second complaint, all agriculture products are expensive. But then they make a reportage, you know. The problem is that uh, there is too, too much uh, cartels in the um, purchasing power and they reduce the prices uh, for the farmers. Okay, so what's the problem here now? Is it expensive, the agriculture book, or is it too cheap? Yeah? And then they pitch against uh, Mercosur, because that's very dangerous. Yeah? But of course, you know, that's what they produce in Latin America, agriculture goods. To reject that, that's quite an outrageous claim. Yeah? And so you see. And the next report was about environmental protection of the rivers in Germany. They have not implemented the 2015 deadline, 2015 deadline of the EU um, water directive to clean up. Look how many, it's again the trucks here. Look how many trucks and it's a normal working day. It's the 2nd of November. Yeah? Look what is going on here. And there is all this prosperity, but it's blocked by the enemies of the prosperity and of progress, the German left and uh, their uh, stepchildren, uh, the Greens, because, but the Greens are more reasonable. Yeah? The Greens are good. Yeah? The Greens we need. So, the Greens and the Liberals and the Conservatives must form the new governing majorities in Europe. And of course you need uh, to fight uh, the left and the nationalists, uh, the Nazis. So, no, of course, what we need is of course more free trade agreements. Anyhow, <clears throat> Anybody understands who wants to understand in goodwill that we need, by the way, wind power here, yeah, very good, I'm happy. And we need more highways, yes. We need also more railways, yes. We need better infrastructure in energy, digital, in water, in highways and in railways, yes, we all need that. And obviously, we need to be active and not sleeping. <laughs> and we need more openness to the world for people, of course, for first of all, for Europeans to come and to work at the European labor market, 
but also for the rest of the world there must be some better system than all this smuggling and all this disaster and we need anyhow more people and that is very very good and so we need to work and also we need to limit the speed at the motorways in Germany because I'm now going 130 that should be okay because it's a two-lane highway and here the people are behaving like crazy yeah? they're pushing me always ahead yeah and I really don't like it yeah anyhow I don't like it and they should behave a bit better this speed limit is again you know one of the worst things I'm really angry about the free democrats yeah? they are the German liberals but you know honestly they are a complete disaster yeah? because I loved Westerwelle, I was fully with him, God bless him. But uh, the people who now here are with the FDP, you know, they are, the speed limit um, is the SPT, the FDP, yeah? They are the only one who are blocking a decent normal European speed limit. And I think we should now in the Ukraine war, in the Russian war, in this energy crisis resulting, have 100 km, uh, km per hour all European wide, in the whole continent doesn't make such a big difference if you're driving 120 or 100 okay then let's have a bit of a phase uh, towards 130 and only start to punish at 130 but you know more than 130 nobody has to drive at the motorway it's very risky it doesn't bring a lot and it brings more accidents and it's absolutely more consumption of petrol so it's very annoying at the motorway and so let's stop it at 120 uh, 30 yeah but European wide. I'm really much more now for European common regulation and enforcement everywhere. And the FDP is the contrary. They are the Germany first party by excellence. So Germany should have 100 unlimited speed limit according to the FDP. That's the first thing. Then the second thing is they are now spending 200 billion of uh, German taxpayers' money to subsidize energy. No other European country can go into that direction. Yeah? And they are not spending enough for Ukraine, but a lot for the energy consumption, 200 million. Yeah? And everybody gets a huge subsidy. <laughs> okay, and that's the ultimate uncompetitive and unfair behavior in the internal market. If you have all very high energy prices and just one party goes absolutely berserk and subsidizes its own energy consumers and the rest goes bunkers. I mean that this is not fair. You don't have to be a competition expert or a subsidy expert, state subsidy regulator. I mean, you can easily understand that. Additionally, Lindner is blocking a big new second uh, European debt uh, package, which is the very logical thing in such a crisis to fund things together. We have a common energy crisis. We all face the uh, Ukraine refugee crisis. We all face uh, the rearmament crisis because Merkel has uh, disarmed Europe and so we all face the same so we need to carry the burden together the French as well because some countries are paying very little for the for the Ukraine war like the French by the way and uh, the Germans actually do pay uh, something at least yeah. also militarily they are active in terms of supplies but not very visible and it's good to shame them to do more but uh, they are doing something yeah latest numbers were very clear in relation to the GDP the Germans are actually very active and much more active than the Austrians which are only giving 0.1 and the Germans are giving 2.4 you see how many cars are going east-west because Europe is uniting just the infrastructure is not this is a real big problem so anyhow such a debt package is really necessary in order to build all the infrastructure east-west to integrate Ukraine and the Balkans and also to transit all countries towards the Euro because it makes no sense to keep the Rivna or the Ley or whatever we have funny currencies and they are all very pretty unsustainable and they will all go in the next big Eastern European currency crisis we will have now in 2023 if we don't uh, stabilize the currency system of Eastern Europe by euroizing it. It's so logical, I can hardly believe that I'm the only one to promote it. Yeah? Anyhow, it's a shame. Mr. Busek did it for Kosovo and Montenegro. I followed his idea. He was angry with me. I shouldn't make any proposals in the media. Yes, I do, <laughs> Mr. Busek, and yes, I did. 
<laughs> and I will follow his direction because he also never listened to his superiors and political mentors. And so, God bless him. Rest in peace, Dr. Bosek. I will certainly continue to make a lot of proposals, like for example the proposals for the Euro for Peace, which I made in the Presse. It was very important, I think, good proposal. And I'm very happy I made it. And I'm still calling. Today, for example, we see that uh, Serbia has, uh, it's the third time they fully mobilized now and put the uh, armed forces into high alert because of the crisis uh, with the number plates. Basically, and the um, Kosovo government implementing the rule of law in Kosovo that everybody should have Kosovo number plates. Also, the people living in the north of Kosovo, they think that this is outrageous. Yes, they might think so, but that's the rule of law. They live in Kosovo, and if they don't like it, yes, okay, then let's start another war. But I call again immediately for the direct destruction of the military bases in Niš, in Budajevo and in Raška and in one big lightning strike all the Serb military installations must be destroyed. In Vokuple, Vokuple is the one, sorry, not Budajevo, that's on the road to Budajevo in Kosovo up to Vokuple. There is the tank army which is ready to strike Let's strike that army. There is also in Kragujevac uh, the military airport, the uh, Morava military airport, and there is in Niš, obviously the military airport, there is also this Russian humanitarian center, which is a secret service base of the Russians in Niš, which is so important and so strategic and must be destroyed in one big strike by the American cruise missiles from the 6th Navy. That is the absolute best way to handle that, and I hope they will do it in a fast and determined mission to end the aggressive potential of the Serb army, which they have, yeah, because, you know, they have an army, they have a 1.2 billion budget of defense, because we Europeans, full as we are, we pay all their highways, all their schools, everything that is happening in terms of investment is funded by the EIB, by the EBRD, Partly because Serbia is the central country, obviously, you know, there needs to be a lot of infrastructure built to connect with Turkey and with Greece. Uh, that's all rational, you know, I don't say something against that one. But we give a lot and then uh, some politicians say, was a debate now on Twitter, should we <coughs> freeze uh, Serbia EU candidate status? And then Mr. Martens, famous journalist from Germany, says, no, that doesn't make any sense because anyhow it's frozen and blah, blah, blah. But it would make a lot of sense, obviously, to cut the funding. Because now, again, for the energy crisis for this winter, the EU has promised Serbia 160 million. Cut it, freeze it, and freeze all the EIB and, EIB, EIB and EBRD funding, all the EPA projects, freeze everything, and then the Serbs will come to ration very, very soon. It will be very, very soon, because it's the same with Hungary. They, of course, the Hungarians, they can blackmail us now, that's what they do, with the big question of, of the NATO membership, because the Hungarians know very well that must be done. And so we have uh, basically two NATO membership um, countries um, ratification, that's uh, the Turkish and the Hungarians, and they are blocking that now. The Turkish say, um, let's uh, sell us to the Americans because they are big, they are with the Americans to negotiate and they say, give us the F-43 and allow us to keep the S-400 from um, uh, the Russians. Yeah? That is un incompatible and will not happen, but at least the F-33 um, they will get from the Americans, I think so. And then um, they will be an even more important military actor in the Mediterranean and then we will have also the question of the Hungarians. The Hungarians they will be settled with the Germans and the issue is here very clearly the Hungarians blackmail us with this 8 billion which the EU has frozen as a result of their blatant uh, break of the rule of law and so it's very difficult uh, moment because the EU will have to break their own principles just uh, to let uh, 
so Sweden and Finland in and uh, Orban will celebrate his blackmail policy and anyhow he could have got the money from the start if he just didn't behave like a complete uh, Putin paid poodle fool and break all the laws uh, and annoy everybody else so it's not an additional cost which we have but it's additional annoyment of this man uh, Orban is the biggest disappointment in Europe uh, but uh, we all knew it we knew him already so it's not a disappointment in that sense because if you know somebody and you did never expect anything better then obviously it's quite logical what he's doing yeah I'm here now on the sixth and they push me hard I will move in again yeah. am I the best driver in the world certainly not am I the worst I don't think so but I'm far from I enjoy driving but long drives I did so many in, in the Balkans and in Ukraine in my times and I had it enough and here of course it's pleasant because it's sunny and it's all highway but still the German highways are different than the Ukraine highways they're of course better but here there is a lot of economic activity yeah? these, these trucks are unbelievable I mean in they are the level of density of economic activity in especially southwestern Germany is simply amazing. And you see the connectivity with Nuremberg, with Bavaria. I'm now at this borderland between... I'm actually in Bavaria already to my best knowledge. But from Baden-Württemberg to Bavaria, from Stuttgart to Nuremberg, that's of course a really very important economic center. Yeah. This is a bit, yeah, I call for sanctioning of Serbia and it makes a lot of sense if you do it, especially when you, of course, include all the freezing of all the financial support, yeah. That is the only thing which has impact, yeah. just a status and then um, Vucic will not care. By the way, I, I read him, I considers resignation because it's so complicated job. I would be the most happy person if he resigns, yeah. Then, of course, Putin cannot threaten his life anymore and Serbia will transcend into chaos and we can federalize Serbia because the minorities, as I've made also very clear in Novi Pazar in my visit to Sanjak and Senica and also to other parts of Serbia, I will go in the future. It is true that Serbia needs to be federalized because it is a centralistic socialist disaster and it needs to be reformed and the only way is to be a federal Serbia inside the, the NATO and the EU and with the Euro. And that was actually my peace proposal, uh, to offer Serbia the Euro for the exchange of recognition of Kosovo. And still, you know, that's a really very feasible and good idea. And, but okay, I made it once in the public. Should I then publish it in all newspapers of Europe or what? Yeah? I shouldn't it be enough to be in one major daily? You really wonder. Anyhow, Dr. Busek didn't like it but I liked it very much and I had so many debates with him about uh, integrating Ukraine in the southeastern European organizations from 2016 on and I always say let's do it let's go 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 it's all on YouTube but then they said no it's too dangerous Putin will make war so we didn't do all the things I said because the EU because of the fear of war with Russia uh, bought a lot of energy from Putin, funded him for another, from 15 onwards to basically that was the moment of the Minsk II and so that was uh, seven years of additional funding, hundreds of millions, we are talking now whatever 300 million, seven years, two trillion of euro were additionally transferred to Russia to make the war mobilization more feasible and to build a lot of reserves and that was the economic thing and then obviously we didn't include uh, Ukraine in anything more, yeah? just the DCFTA. There was no integration in uh, Regional Cooperation Council, RCC, no in CEFTA, nothing like Central European Free Trade. That was my proposal, very soft ways. There was no EU candidate status, there was no NATO map. There was nothing for Ukraine from 2015 to 2022 and still Putin attacked. <laughs> You know, he attacked despite we doing all the maximum appeasement we could do. The Europeans on their knees, yeah. 
sucking Russian gas and oil as much as they could, yeah, and the uranium and coal, as much as it could, two trillion of transfers towards Russia since Minsk II and uh, the start of the war. And then you have all these additional disasters, yeah, this uh, complicitly in the development of the Russian technology and so on during the war, since 2000, uh, because we all knew that Minsk II was a gigantic volcano. It was a gigantic volcano which blew in our face despite us knowing it, that it is a volcano. So who can help these policymakers who transfer two trillion of euros over there while they know that it is a complete volcano and they have not made any preparations for an armed struggle. Germany has disarmed significantly since 2015. So as Austria, just very few countries have really prepared while we all knew that this was volcano. Hey, oh, it's very annoying. Yes, and so we are in that situation. We didn't also not euroize the Ukraine currency. And so we have now all the costs and all the people from Ukraine at our markets, in our houses, because uh, there will be additionally a million coming to Germany in this winter because Putin, the great friend of Wolfgang Schüssel, is destroying uh, the whole infrastructure of energy of Ukraine. And that has, of course, a big effect. Now we are lucky because it's very warm October, but November hopefully will also be so, uh, good because then I hope that Ukraine still makes the lightning strike south from Zaporizhia into Melitopol and Berdyansk and liberate uh, the, uh, southern, the central part of the occupied territory because that would isolate the Kherson forces where uh, Russia has put its elite uh, warriors uh, into Kherson and of course that's very difficult once they are fortified but the logical thing is if one area is very fortified and they are the best troops yeah, then uh, put all your troops uh, into the center of Ukraine push south and destroy and divide uh, Russia uh, forces into two halves yeah, and then you have uh, encircled them in Kherson and they will have to surrender or run or basically fight for their life yeah. and they will have to run basically if they must be evacuated once the Russian uh, forces understand that they are completely encircled and uh, that their uh, last chance here there is some solar that's good everything should be solarized here I'm so much for solar but it's like that driving now it's one it's close to two o'clock I have not reached Nuremberg Nuremberg is then the Danube value because now this is the crossing of the mountains which separate Bavaria and Baden-Württemberg actually I was very very far going now with the children by train to Frankfurt then I went to Frankfurt Hahn which is again another 120 kilometers further to the west that is really close to France already. And then in the Hunsrück, in the mountains on the other side of the Rhine, this territory the French always wanted to have. <laughs> yeah, Roche said, until the Rhine must be the natural border of La France. And but it never happened because it's deeply unjust. Because there is no French people living so far west or east and they never were it's always German speaking people yeah that is long gone past <laughs> I don't want to provoke anybody too much but the past still matters obviously and what I see now is the demise of uh, the Russian Federation and then Königsberg and the ancient city of Königsberg and it will be, it's now Kaliningrad. Kalinin, you know, that's a, one of these communist disasters like uh, um, Kirov Grad, you know, and all these communists, they call the whole cities uh, Stalingrad. Imagine this kind of um, uh, craziness, yeah? to have some totally disaster, evil, communist person 
to then call cities after themselves. Kalinin. Uh, that should be changed towards logically Prussia. Russia. Russia is the only logical term for that one. And it will be like that. And it will be like that. And there will be again from Russia to Prussia. We can call it like that. Everybody in Europe neglects East-West. Yeah? I don't know why. There is a hate for East-West infrastructure in all of Europe. <laughs> it's an absolutely disaster. Only Austria does it because we are the classical East-West country. But Germany does North South. Oh, here's some solar. Solar is good. Where there's solar, there's good. That's absolutely. This is good. Every whole Germany should be solarized. And whole Europe. Yeah, guys, this is the situation. I'm so happy. A little bit of yawning. No, now it's two o'clock soon and I'm heading towards Nuremberg. Then I'm in the Danube Valley and then it goes along the Danube beautifully. Yeah, I hope that we will learn and we will really decouple from Russia and because for years now for example another topic central asia for years now i have been posting and writing that we should have a central asian strategy yeah? that we should have free trade with uzbekistan now the german government goes there <laughs> i mean is it so difficult to understand that these countries want to have normal trading relations with the european union and they want to have a free trade organization they want to be safe Nobody over there wants to be attacked or run by Russia. Russia is a failed state. They know it much well, much better than we. But no, we always do this kind of, yeah, Russia is so important because we learned it in school. <laughs> Fuck it, eh? uh, really. I cannot understand it. This kind of left and right adulation of Russia and Stalin so evil. I mean, when you read about his crimes, he was a mass murderer all the time. Yeah. He cared very little. He had fun to kill people. He killed so many of them. Yeah, that's the truth. So, good. Half an hour video, you see, this is the crossing at this beautiful moment. I will now make a stop again and make some photos listen to some podcast and come back with some updates about the European reform agenda, what it means, why I'm motivated, what I want to do and I will keep you posted for the coming months. I will discuss my agenda of reform and I will show you the southern German motorways and how it's going here, the road from Frankfurt, from Darmstadt towards Vienna on this beautiful 2nd of November 2022. Thanks a lot and more to come from Paxa Rubiana. Bye.